The BBC. Is it now the biased broadcasting corporation ripe for reform, or is it still an invaluable national treasure? Hello and welcome and Happy New Year. I'm Mark Sidwell and this is Counterculture, the cultural discussion show that takes no prisoners, even if you haven't paid your licence fee. Today, we're discussing the BBC, its ideological bent, and the future of its business model. As the 2020s get underway, the BBC might seem as powerful as ever, but Boris Johnson's new government is boycotting key current affairs shows and even threatening to decriminalise the licence fee for non-payment. Currently, the licence fee is compulsory for everyone who owns a TV set in the UK. But with the rise of Netflix and YouTube, Many critics are suggesting that the licence fee has had its day and that the BBC should move to a subscriber model. Here to discuss that with me today are David Cox, veteran TV producer who's worked on classic shows like Walden, was head of current affairs for London Weekend Television, Rafe Hadelman Koo of the New Culture Forum, historian and broadcaster, Sophie Sandor, who's a documentary maker and writer, and James Dellingpole, writer uh, podcaster and TV critic for The Spectator. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, let's start with the question of bias. Uh, David, you've worked a lot on current affairs. Is the BBC missing the mark at the moment or is Boris Johnson just trying to avoid criticism? When it comes to uh, Labour versus Conservative, as we've had all these complaints about the election, I think that's all basically nonsense. I mean, the BBC is very keen not to be seen to be biased on the, those central issues. It tries very hard, it gets it wrong sometimes, but all the complaints about that, I think, are silly. Where the problem arises is not over the central issues, it's over cultural questions, and there's a good reason for that. Mm -hmm. The BBC is not supposed to be impartial. It would be absurd if it was impartial. We would have to spend as much time discussing whether the earth was flat or it was whether it was round. Mm. It, ha it can only be it's supposed to exercise due impartiality on matters of public controversy. And that means it has to decide what are the boundaries within which it's going to be impartial. Otherwise, it, it would be absurd. Now, the trouble is, although that's OK when it comes to Labour versus the Conservatives, because everybody agrees that you should be impartial between those two things, when it comes to cultural issues, there isn't that agreement. And th essentially, the BBC depends on working within a consensus. Uh, and there isn't a consensus about a lot of, lot of these things like uh, um, transgender, feminism, mm -hmm. racism and so on. And the BBC therefore has to demarcate its consensus. And wh however it does that, it will be criticised. Um, th the fact is that it tends to demarcate it within, a, within parameters that seem natural to the metropolitan elite mm -hmm. rather than the country at large. And that's mainly, I think, where it really does come unstuck and it gets attacked, understandably. But the idea that that's because it's not doing something simple it should be doing is wrong. It's, it, would, it would be bound to get attacked. It gets attacked in the way it does because um, as this sort of institution it, it, it is, a great big public sector monolith, it, it's biased towards the, ad, ad the values of the metropolitan elite. Mm. That's its problem. And of course, you raised the question of impartiality, but it's not true that it's just the BBC who has to make those judgments too. It's also, I suppose, its relationship with Ofcom. Well, and and one thing yeah. that happened at the end of last year, there was a report in October where, where Ofcom uh, was at pains to say that impartiality didn't mean neutrality and it wanted to see broadcasters having the latitude to challenge views that they thought were controversial and not backed up by facts. So in some ways, the broadcasters have been given a little more wiggle room to be aggressive. Well, um, I, I would say that, that I want to uh, take your first point. I mean, all broadcasters in this country are required to be as impartial as each other mm -hmm. when it comes to um, public affairs. Uh, as to uh, whether or not the, 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 the rules are, ch are being changed, I think there has been a, 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 very a very major complaint that the BBC has been too frightened to be impartial on certain issues of fact. Mm -hmm. The most obvious is climate change where the BBC has been criticised for giving you know, equal weight to climate deniers and, and scientists who obviously know things that these climate deniers are getting wrong. Mm -hmm. um, on, I think on matters of fact, the BBC can be criticised for being too impartial, and it certainly should be braver at taking a stand on matters of fact. Um, I think probably it, the, the opposite is the case when it comes to opinion. Um, it's, 
it, it's too ready to um, shut out certain opinions that ought to be given weight. Mm -hmm. James, I mean, you've been a strong critic of the BBC, and particularly for its cultural output, which David was raising. Yeah. There. I mean, what, what's your take on all of this? Well, it, yeah, can I just uh, pick David up on, on that, the, the, the climate change point? The, for, for, for some considerable time now, the BBC has refused to give airspace to, to so-called climate deniers, i.e. people who, who are, are sceptical about the quality of the science, suggesting that we're all going to hell in a handcart mm -hmm. because of this thing called man-made global warming. Um, I think it's a complete journalistic failure um, because actually the issue is, is still very much open for de debate and I, don't, I, I, I would um, disagree strongly with, with the notion that it's scientists who know everything versus deniers who know nothing, which is what you were kind of, kind of implying. Nevertheless, I think the bigger problem with the BBC is to do with things that aren't to do with, with current affairs. Mm -hmm. the, f the fact that you, you cannot watch, for example, a BBC drama now without seeing this tick box um, United Colours of Benetton casting, for example. It, there was, uh, what, was that? what was the one about the bodyguard? Where mm -hmm. the, spi the, the sniper teams w had, had black female snipers. Now you show me a black female sniper anywhere in, in, in London, I'll, I'll be very impressed. Um, you notice these things. The, Doctor Who is now so impossibly woke that it's, it's gone broke, basically. But, but this happens across the board. You cannot find BBC drama that doesn't play this game. So I, I would agree that, that party politics, maybe it, it, it does strive to, impartial, to be impartial. But in terms of the culture wars, the BBC is very much on the liberal left, woke, social justice warrior side of the argument. I suppose the question is how much that interferes with quality. I mean, for example, there, there are things that have been weaker, like perhaps the War of the Worlds, which I think was very broadly rubbished, and then Dracula, which is pretty equally woke in many yeah. ways, but a lot of people thought that it was really quite good, at least the, the well, earlier the, the, episodes. Yeah, yeah it, had, it had its moments, but it, the, the, the first episode where it, where it was sort of gothic was fine, the second one was Agatha Christie was, was, was less good, the mm. third one it was Doctor Who was absolute pants. Um, another example, I suppose, would be the adaptation of Les Miserables. Now, this is where the BBC is going. So you had um, a, uh, a black Inspector Javert. Mm. Well, the, the book was written in, in the 1830s, or set in the 1830s, rather. I don't believe that it, it is at all implausible that you'd have a black police inspector in 1830s France. Now, you, you may say, well, of course, we, we move with the times and, and, and things change. Well, in that case, why didn't they have wind farms in the background? Why didn't they have um, TV aerials or whatever? Because TV drama, classic t TV drama, drama, is ultimately about verisimilitude. You're trying to recreate a period, the look of the, of the period. Mm. Um, the BBC is failing to do that. So it is, it is sacrificing um, entertainment value and, and verisimilitude for woke. Sophie, you've worked a lot on uh, education issues. I mean, how do you think the BBC deals with those? Do you think they're, they're covering the ground properly? Well, first, I wanted to move back to the current affairs yeah, sure. aspect of it because I think it's really important to say that the BBC is biased, and there have been a lot of case studies done. I see, I saw some by the IE mm -hmm. um, from health warnings for free market think tanks. Free market think tanks are far more likely to have health warnings and left leaning mm -hmm. think tanks. Um, representation of Leave voices before the Brexit referendum and before uh, on the lead up to and during the 2015 mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. election. Uh, so we know that it is biased, and uh, saying that um, no organisation is free of bias, and indeed it might not be and probably isn't desirable for an organisation to aim to be objective all of the time and unbiased. The reason it's a concern with the BBC is because of its respected reputation, mm -hmm. and uh, people do not expect it to be biased as much, and it's, it's providing a lot of online news content, over 75%, and uh, people are not free to unsubscribe, they're forced to pay for it. So that's why bias isn't concerning to me in general, but it is with the BBC. Mm. And, and the sheer dominance of it as well. I think that, you know, there's some stats, it's three in four of us turn to the BBC regularly for news, which is more than the, the next two put together. It's enormous how much control they have over the, the news space in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. But, but on the, the education point, I mean, d d are, they, are they missing a trick? Are they not covering the important issues? Well. Just yesterday, the isolation booths issue came up. Mm -hmm. um, so, left progressive educationalists often use it as 
a, a method to promote their teaching methods and they're doing it a lot uh, through BBC News websites recently and using misleading pictures mm -hmm. of, for example, isolation booths. What, what is an isolation booth? It's where uh, someone is excluded during the day from the rest of their peers oh, I see. for bad behaviour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw lots of evidence that the BBC is using very misleading pictures, conflating terms to stir up uh, anti-traditional teaching methods and discipline mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. the public. Uh, so that's just one example I saw yesterday, yeah, which has been going on for months. Mm. Rafe, uh, to come to you, I I'd like to again to go back to this point about current affairs because I'm interested. Uh, obviously, there hasn't been that much sympathy uh, for that point of view, at least from, from David and, e and e even from James. But Boris Johnson and his new government are certainly stirring it up and trying to delegitimise the BBC. I mean, is that a problem? When they're, are, they, are they basically using this to try and get away with things, to not cut, stand up to scrutiny? When they say, well, we're not going on these flagship programmes because you know, they're biased and we're going to go and do the soft interviews on Radio 5 Live or whatever it is, are they just trying to get publicity without having to face hard questions? Well, I think the BBC now is the institutional sick man of Britain to the degree that actually with a, ten, with a potential 10 years of Tory government, this is a time to recreate what Thatcher did in 1986 when she got Marmaduke Hussey into the BBC as BBC chairman to clean up the shop. And basically, in 97, you've had a similar coup was undertaken by the Labour government in which basically you know, public appointments are always in the Guardian newspaper, for example, for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the BBC, since is basically since the late 80s and 90s, adopted this very progressive woke agenda, which in the last 15 years has become, become a real problem. And so I think that's... The problem with the BBC is that this constant aggressive nature of, of interviewing saps the will to live. And shows like this are very important because there's a freeness, freeness to develop your own ideas without being interrupted. You don't have 15 second sound bites mm. and constant interruptions. During election campaigns, however, I think Andrew Neil and others are quite correct. You know, the BBC is impartial during election campaigns and during the referendum campaign. That's when politicians need to be scrutinised. And I think Boris Johnson should have appeared before Andrew Neil because it's in that period you want to test the manifesto and see if they're up to task. Mm. But be outside those periods, I think there's far too much reliance on this Paxman type of interrogation. And a, m a lot more healthy discussion could be had if you actually try to give someone a chance to develop their ideas without accusing them of basically being a borderline uh, criminal. Yes, but, but how do we get there if that's so? I mean, uh, it's interesting what you say about people in the past having undertaken coups, whatever. I mean, current Director General Lord, Lord Hall has said, well, I don't see a problem here. You know, we're being criticised from the left, we're being criticised from the right, we, we think we're fine in the middle. He's obviously not really uh, in the mood to do much. Johnson wants change, but what can he actually do? Well, essentially, you need to, well, if, I think that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is a very good model here. There, the, the, the president of the CBC is appointed by the Governor General, the Queen's representative, on, on the advice of the Prime Minister. Mm. And you really have to get away from this idea of the BBC Trust and the BBC Board and have a light, night of the long knives, really, and just clear out the top there. Because, you know, it's no secret that the two most read newspapers in the BBC are The Guardian and The Independent. And in the last 15 years, you've seen essentially the BBC engaged in what I would call an act of institutional suicide. It's sort of self-harming by destroying its brands. You know, we've mentioned Doctor Who. <laughs> the, pol the ratings have shown a huge decline. Why? Because you've now got a female Doctor Who. Nobody wanted a female Doctor Who. They know that it's losing. You know, you've seen this with Charlie's Angels. You've seen this with um, the female Ghostbusters. These products and, 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 and icons don't need to be tampered with and people are rejecting them and yet the BBC, despite seeing this decline in ratings, continues along this path, you know, and I think if it's not if it's not taken in hand, people are going to get turned off. ITN is now regarded as a much more reputable source by the public than the BBC and the BBC are the, ar are the architects of their own downfall. But of course, um, journalism um, and uh, the arts are both very left-wing professions sort of by their nature. It's hard to see even if you change a few people at the top of the BBC, would that would that really make a difference? No, I think James? I think the BBC is is screwed beyond measure. Um, and actually, <laughs> I just want it I want it burnt to the ground, and I want the earth salted. Um, <laughs> there is there is there is no hope. There, uh, but we're not going to get that. So so at least let's expose Pe it. People do love it. It's expose it. Well, some well, people do. Do, I, I, do they really? Do who, they really? who loves it? Well, they don't trust it as much as they do. But sort of half the the public still trusts it. But that's. Yeah. It's not exactly love, yeah. perhaps, but you know, it's it's seen as a people are slow, institution. People are slow to notice things, aren't they? Because because it's still got 
it's still got the same initials, BBC. Yeah. It's still got the same shaped programmes, more mm -hmm. or less. So people think, well, it must be the same thing. It does thing. many fine things. The World Service is still pretty good. If an organisation gets billions of pounds a year, it's bound to do something good with it. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, not yeah, rather right. too impressive in the context. But is there... Does it, does it have to be destroyed? Would you agree with James there is, is the only answer to completely get rid of it, if there's some way to do that? I'm very pro-privatisation of the mm -hmm. BBC and for a subscription model to be instituted. I, I don't think there's any good case at all for that not happening. Um, it was designed 100 years ago. Yes, it's changed in the meantime, but the way that the commercial landscape is now, um, the way technology is advanced, uh, barriers to entry for production companies, mm. produ producers of content online and on television are very low now. Fixed costs are low uh, economically. There's just no case for forcing people to pay for this. Well, I, I disagree Perhaps. completely with that. I'm a proud patriot, but I'm not a neocon. I'm a high Tory. I believe in noblesse oblige. I believe in educating. And I believe in the BBC as an institution that should stand up for British values, British culture, British history, all the things that Lord Reith wanted really, to raise the level of public discourse and exposure to those things that we, we espouse as being the best of British. You know, it was the BBC that had the golden age of British television, that got our civilization and the ascent of man, that gave us the great dramas and the great comedies, which have become now icons of British culture. It's lost its way, and that's the issue, is how do we get it back on a, a footing where you can have actually decent royal coverage, for example. I'm a royal broadcaster. Sky has for a long time been far superior to the BBC, where you have Fern Cotton, rather than an experienced person, interviewing dogs for, for the Diamond Jubilee, rather than actually focusing on the history and ceremony of an occasion. It's, it's that loss of, of ability. And it all stems down to, despite this great drive for diversity at the BBC, they seem to have forgotten that diversity of opinion is the most important thing of all. And it's that lack of diversity of opinion that has created this groupthink, which has made them so detached from reality, and so disconnected from the public as a whole, who are crying out to have someone actually stand up for British values and British culture, and not for necessarily for minority interests all the time, but to actually celebrate the glories of being British rather than being ashamed of them and always told that they are somehow evil and for being, you know, white working class or or in any way enjoying having a flag on their window. Mm. Well, well, Mark, I mean, I think, I think James and Sophie may be more likely to get something like their way um, than they think. Well, because really? the system can't carry on as it is anyway. Mm. I mean, wh whether you'd like it to change or, um, or, or not, um, it depends on the licence fee. Um, the licence fee depends on the public being prepared to pay at the moment £154.50 a year for something that is, uh, is of no interest to more and more of them. I mean, And the, the under 75, uh, the over 75s from June have to start paying again, yeah, which is some but the 3 million people. Yeah, but the BBC's problem isn't with the over 75s, it's with the young. At the moment, 16 to 24 years, if you take them, then fewer than half of them now watch any BBC at all in mm. a given week. Now those people are going to become householders. When they become householders, they're t when they're told, oh, £154.50, for what? They're going to ask. I mean, uh, people go home now. They have on their remote control uh, a red button saying Netflix. Netflix. Instead of pressing the BBC One button saying, "Well, what are the BBC showing?" Show me. A lot of them press the Netflix button, and they see the Netflix homepage, and that's all they want to see. And they work from there. And then the idea. So the, the idea that they therefore have to pay this fee, and people who don't pay this fee, they're still getting sent to prison. There are 180,000 people a year prosecuted for not paying this, what now seems an utterly ridiculous fee. I mean, as Sophie said, it's not a monopoly anymore. This made sense when the BBC was the only TV there was, or the only radio as it was when it was 10 shillings a week. Mm. It was 10 shillings a week for, tw for its first 20 years. Um, and that was fine, but it isn't fine. Now that the BBC is increasingly becoming just part of what's available to people, why should everybody pay for what is um, something that fewer and fewer people are actually going to watch. Now, you can justify it in terms of the things that uh, you're talking about, where uh, it's things of national importance that the market wouldn't supply. But most of the money from the licence fee goes on entertainment. So why should people who don't want that particular kind of entertainment pay for other people's entertainment, especially when a lot of them are single mothers who face the prospect of prosecution? Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Now, this is going to become more and more apparent as these young people can't go through the system. Now, and, and, and so much is that obvious that you even have um, BBC 
uh, enthusiasts now saying the BBC has got to uh, have a different kind of funding system or it's doomed. The only people who don't seem to see this are the BBC management themselves who cling to the licence fee because they're so frightened about what would happen mm. if it was taken away from them. But it seems to me something is going to change anyway. But, but what is the first step? Do you, do you simply wait for that to happen or, or is it perhaps about, I mean Sophie, what do you think about bringing the BBC back? Because obviously it's kept expanding and expanding the internet site and all the uh, internet news is news, a lot more radio um, programs now than there used to be, radio channels on particular yeah. types of youth music and, and God knows what. Uh, should it ditch the entertainment, which as David was saying is very expensive, and sort of come back to a narrow more sort of Rethian agenda with that? I think it should go more global mm. and it might bring in even more money and it probably would, it would bring more money than it does currently from the licence fee if it went commercial and went global because all of those little niche channels and programmes, mm. religion, religious, uh, in the arts, educative, uh, while domestically the market might be small, it could get a huge uh, payment base all over the world and so I think it should go more global and it would if it was privatised and start thinking more commercially and you're right the BBC has lost its way most a lot of its entertainment because it's Radio 1 and Radio 2 were forced to compete with other radio stations uh, you know Big Brother, ITV's uh, reality TV shows the BBC is being forced to compete with all of that and that's not what it was supposed to be about and I like you I'm a huge fan of the BBC and I would probably pay a subscription fee so I don't see why you don't favour just people like you and me paying for it and it being privatised and improved and more global thinking. Because it should be available to all people that's the whole point of a national service broadcaster you want people to actually have access to documentaries on subjects nobody else would cover um, and I think for youth particularly I mean the big danger for the Tory party I mean this is why I think Boris Johnson needs to take hold of this is the fact that if the election was had been held you know, just between those who are under 25 and 18 there would have been no Tory MPs at all in Parliament, right? Because you have a Department of Education, secondary school system and universities that are predominantly left. I mean, eight, le eight Liberals for every one Tory in, in conservative in, in, in university setting. And the BBC, the few shows that the, that the youth are watching, the MASH Report or uh, Frankie Boyle's New World Order, I mean, these are Marxist <laughs> programmes, basically. But as David says, they're, they're not watching. I mean, if the youth no, but, aren't but, watching no, the BBC, but they are there's watching, not much point But in those are the shows that they're watching, right? Those are the shows with the youngest audience. And the shows that are, that are targeted at them, all they're getting at school and on television when they watch is a pure Marxist agenda. That's why you need to have a clearing out of all of this. But I think you put your finger on the, on the fundamental problem with the BBC. I mean, I, I, I'm emotionally sympathetic to your high Tory argument, but I don't think it's ever going to stack up. And the reason is that if you've got an institution which purports to be for the whole nation, you, you said yourself it's got to appeal to everyone, you have an institution which spends more time worrying about about appealing to different groups on a, on a kind of uh, a representative level than it does actually just making good quality programs regardless. I, 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 and I, I also kind of dispute the, the, the notion that, that, that out there are, are black people who want to watch black black TV and young people who want to watch young peop TV. People I'm just want to watch good all. TV. Yeah, but you say it should be for everyone. I mean, uh, no, it should be accessible to everyone in the nation. I'm not saying that programs should be made for every every group within that. I'm saying there should be programs about, you know, British coal miners history, about, you know, the brass bands in the north, everything. That should be available for everybody because otherwise you're never going to learn about that anywhere else. And it's television now, not books or magazines where people learn about these things. They're not getting this at school. Programs about the British Empire and the good things that the British Empire did, you know? <laughs> those, those are the things to which everyone though. should have an access right. to, it. Yeah, otherwise yeah. they're not going to get it anywhere else. But, but it seems to me that what you, you really want is, is a different set of values running the British establishment. Because the BBC, in a way, the way it exists, it represents the values of the British establishment. And in the older days, in the Rethian days, it reflected those. And now the establishment probably is kind of remainery and... Liberal elite. Exactly. As was so, always the case, the so upper classes and the working classes are far more clo are far closer on values and on, on many other things yes. than this removed meritocratic Islington type of liberal elite bubble. And Maybe. that's the problem. They've but, been but disconnected. But can you solve the BBC without changing the entire well, British Mark establishment? Thompson, Mark Thompson, former Director General, said we need to bring more conservatives into positions of power. He said that. You know, Helen Bowden, the former director of BBC News, said there is an, a huge bias here in terms of immigration. Migration watch we refuse to take seriously. We interviewed fewer UKIP candidates in 2012 than 2007, despite its huge growth. Mm. Peter Sissons, John Humphreys, Michael Burke. I mean, they've all, Jeff Randall, they, they've all admitted to, even Andrew Marr, a former Marxist, said that there's a deep cultural bias here which needs to be addressed because that is the very reason, as with Brexit, 
and the civil service, all these institutions have become disconnected from the public. And you know, this is a public service broadcasting, and the public would like to see this sort of broadcasting. Yeah, the top yeah. brass, of course, are always promising to do something about this bias, but nothing ever changes. It's in the nature of this huge public sector institution mm. and the people it hires, who are copies of the people who are there already, that it's going to adopt the values that, th that permeate the whole of our establishment. And I, I can't see that changing while we have the institution that we do have. But I do think the institution is going to change. It's going to be forced to change by circumstances. I think if Sophie's model of people subscribing mm. to it came, that would sort out the uh, woke Doctor Who issue because people would, if people didn't like it, they wouldn't subscribe to it. And the BBC, well, if, it were, if it did depend on subscriptions for people who are actually watching it, it would then make sure it was giving them what they actually wanted, even if they didn't yeah. want a woke Doctor Who. Well, but perhaps, but, but I mean, Netflix is quite woke. Um, uh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. It's very Sky well. News it doesn't Channel trigger, 4, doesn't trigger me in the same way yeah. that the BBC does. But, but, it, but it's, not clear, it's not clear that it, the market would, would completely reject those things, as long as maybe... I think, the, I think the BBC, I, I, I think you're right, I, th I think the BBC would definitely shift its entertainment output in a less woke direction, because, well, Doctor Who is such a good example. Mm. It, it's just, it's died on its feet. It, it, it could never survive in a commercial environment. Because well, we wouldn't have the BBC to bankroll it, we wouldn't have the viewers to support it. Well, the B, uh, Doctor Who in general could. It's a great brand and, a, and an amazing sort of. Um, they've pretty much they've pretty much killed killed the brand. I mean, they've 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 pretty much given us a sort of black female James Bond, haven't they? They've done the equivalent thereof. <laughs> Well, I haven't seen but the figures. The way, it was when sorry. it first launched. It was quite good. It was, you know, it had learned from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And what well, we're talking, we're talking way, but look, look I, I totally agree that the, the one about this, the statues, Blink, that, um, yeah. that could get, get you, was great. But it had, a, but but even then, that was created by Stephen Moffat, mm. who 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 is is now the godfather of woke. They, they've definitely our culture has 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 embraced this kind of identity politics, cultural Marxism thing. Uh, at, a, at a very rapid and accelerating rate, and I think that you know what what may have been true ten years ago ain't true now. The BBC is is over. One thing I wanted to mention: um, one of the few good things on the BBC is um, Eggheads, that quiz show. And I understand that the BBC is really bothered by Eggheads, the fact that it's mostly watched by older people, and they're thinking of scrapping it just because the audience don't fit into the right profile. Now, what kind of institution? We, we shouldn't be supporting an institution like that. That's, that's wrong. Mm. Mm. But you deal with this. I think mean, the solution to me is quite simple. It's the Royal Charter. The Royal Charter sets out the mandate of the BBC. That comes up for, for review. And uh, Johnson simply has to ensure that the Royal Charter addresses those issues and ensures that there is a commitment to make certain types of, of Royal Broadcasting. And in terms of the funding model, I think, you know, why not bring advertising into the BBC, but not to interrupt programmes? Nobody wants to watch a programme that's interrupted. You put adverts between programmes, so at the end people then have the choice to flick over if they want to, but you allow that. Other broadcasting corporations do that. I'll, I mentioned the Canadians again. They have advertising within their programmes, and they receive funding in general taxation because it's the idea of, of this hypothecated tax as they want to do for the NHS that's the problem people resent having to pay out directly mm -hmm. but if it came from uh, general taxation you wouldn't have this sort of an issue and that's why in Canada only 10% of Canadians want to see the CBC funding cut 40% want it to remain as it is another 40% want to see it raised I think having this license fee is a problem because people then feel that they're being being forced to pay a tax but uh, w when is this up for review I mean is the 2026 is the uh, is the review date, but um, there's no reason that you know Parliament, as we're told, is sovereign. So <laughs> there's no reason they couldn't address this before then. Yes, although uh, as I was saying earlier, Boris Johnson might start to look very much like a, a prime minister who's just trying to hobble his his main critic and enemy. Well, no, so Margaret Thatcher wanted to clean up the BBC in '86, and certainly uh, Ma uh, Marmaduke Hussey did a great deal to improve things then. And th this is the time we have ten years. Tony Blair said we have ten years to make the Tories unelectable through you know, mass immigration and all sorts of other issues. Mm. Boris Johnson should, should say the same thing. Well, w we're nearly out of time, so I just like to go go round before we do and ask people um, if we did have a subscription model for the BBC, would you subscribe? And, and what would you subscribe for? What would be uh, the, the program or programs that make you uh, want to sign up, Rafe? BBC Four and Radio. I don't have a television, mm. so I just watch uh, on iPlayer and Radio Four and BBC Four and Radio Three. Absolutely stellar. The broadcasting there, and unlike the other uh, the other channels, they actually do try to challenge their own liberal biases. So you get documentaries on all sorts of subjects you wouldn't get anywhere else. Those are worth paying for. Worth paying for. David. Well, I think if there was a subscription. 
uh, out entity, uh, as Sophie suggests, then you would also need to, uh, separately something that did the public service programs that Rafe is interested in. I think you'd have to have that split. And the entertainment mm. thing, I agree with Sophie, if the, if the BBC is as popular as it says it is, it ought to be able to make more possibly than it makes out of, out of the license fee. And uh, well, if it went solely for entertainment, but then I think you n need another entity to do the public service job. Interesting. Um, Sophie? Uh, yeah, I would probably, in fact, I would definitely subscribe. I listen to Radio 4 every morning and when mm -hmm. I'm working from home. And also for um, the films, I'm a big fan of, despite being a free marketeer and right of centre, I uh, am a big fan of the Marxist uh, film, filmmakers like uh, Ken Loach, Ben Wheatley, and they're often subsidised by the BBC, National Lottery Fund films. So yes, yeah, social realism films. Okay. James, would you be signing up for the Marxist films? Um, no. Um, <laughs> there was. I watched quite a lot of BBC stuff. The the only BBC drama I saw that was good last year was Giri Hadji, which is out on Netflix anyway this year. So why would I want to submit the ordeal of, of, of Woke? I agree with you about BBC Four. The documentaries are good, but that's really about it. And I can't... I, I don't know how you can stomach Radio 4. It is completely <laughs> unlistenable across the board. Well, I mean, even, even Radio 3 is losing it. I'd pay double for the cancelled woman's hour, I'll just say that. <laughs> in Our Time is, is still pretty good. Yeah, OK, In Our Time is all right. Yeah. That's uh, not, not really a worth forking out for. Though, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I must say, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be... Westminster ever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you to all my guests. Uh, this has been Counterculture. Thank you very much for listening.